my name is Philippe. I'm the uh, founder and designer of Flow. Um, Dave asked me to come in and do a talk. Um, and uh, the way I was thinking, I'll do a, a quick presentation about uh, Flow. Uh, and then I open a session for Q&A. Um, and the focus of the talk is about wing design. Um, I'll go through our range of gliders. We, we have a big range of gliders from beginner paraglider gliders to uh, triple C gliders and to and we also make uh, uh, paramotor gliders. Uh, so it's very diverse. We also make kite surfing kites. Uh, so you're welcome to make, uh, ask questions about any of those uh, gliders and the associations that they can have you know, amongst all, all, all of them. Um, just waiting for the the projector to work. Um, so three years ago we got relocated, we, now, we are now based here, that's where uh, we test all, all the gardens here on, on, in Canangra, on Canangra sites uh, every year. I also go to Europe, uh, I spend three, four months there, also uh, testing and, and, and uh, that's when I kind of like, if I have a, a glider that's tricky or trickier or that needs to, to be certified and uh, I work with pilots there as well. Um, right now we are working on new gliders for, to be released next year. Uh, one of the gliders that we are working on at the moment is the XC Racer 2, which is our YNZ 2 liner. We are, we are also working on the Tandem, the new Tandem. So before, so well, what I wanted to do, I wanted to show on the screen all the range of gliders that, that we have, um, so you know, um, and talk a, a little bit about the design process of each glider. Um, but before that start, you guys are welcome to ask any questions, I guess, and then we can start like that. How long ago did you found the company? Uh, it was, uh, initially it was 2000. Uh, 13, that's when he started. Uh, the first three years I only made like mini wings to fly on the coast and, and, and uh, some prototypes of uh, ENC gliders and EMB gliders just to get familiar, get comfortable that I had a good product and it was safe to then uh, release, certify and have a lot of people flying. Uh, it was a very fun and exciting project those three years because it was very low key and just had friends flying. And, so it was good fun, and we came to the realization where we were doing XC flights uh, on the ENC glider that we had something that was very competitive against the other gliders in the market. That's when we kind of, uh, and I had the, the, the comfort and the confidence to go, okay, that's the time now to go and certify wings. Yeah. Can we get Drew's question out so you can get the word while you were talking? Yeah, and, and it was. Um, once, once we came out in the market, uh, that was a very good timing for us. Um, it was actually the perfect timing because uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to design gliders was to, was that, was that this, you know, I always had this a strong attraction to design. Um, uh, since I was young, I was brought toys to make new toys and I went to uh, study architecture and ended up designing uh, surfboards and then kite surfing kites and now. And then it was, it was a very keen paraglider, so it was natural. It was a natural, natural thing that, that I wanted to design my own paragliders as well. And the discipline I liked the most was was, was racing paragliders in, in high end comps. And uh, and I wanted to just have a glider for me that I could fly. And, and it's one of those things in life and when you combine uh, passion um, with the, the the desire to do something good, and you think that you can do something good. I think good things you can achieve good things, and 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 I could see, you know, flying in competitions and flying in general. I could see the brands that succeed and the brands that didn't succeed, and why. Uh, and even some brands that succeed didn't have the same performance of other other brands, and I could clearly clearly see the difference. And, and it's like ah. Oh, and at the time I was working uh, for the companies as a like test pilot as well, um, and I was proposing, I was suggesting to the designer to do those changes, and he was reluctant. I was like, "Oh, as, as a designer, you have to be really open-minded to 
to explore the possibilities and the changes and, and, and try and see what is possible. So that's why um, the accelerator came along. It was, it was really good timing because the only glider at that time was the Xeno one in the END category. It was flying competitions and was doing really well. So the accelerator came as a as a as alternative to pilots that, that didn't want to fly a triple C but wanted to fly an END and it was the only challenger at that time. Um, and just like that, I got a, um, a network of dealers around the world that, that people didn't want to fly the Xeno, or, or there were dealers for other brands that didn't want to uh, fly the Xeno. They just approached me because I, before that, before um, founding uh, four pair gliders, I, I used to make boards, and the, the worst thing for me was was selling. I, I hated selling. I hated to knock on people's door and say, hey, I have this product you want to buy. And I was I believe that if you have a really good product, people uh, will come to you rather than you try to go to them. And that's exactly what happened to, to Flo and, um, after the XC Racer uh, was released. Now, um, a full circle, we are releasing the XC Racer 2. Uh, we see the success of the Xeno 2 and we want to offer an alternative uh, yeah, a, a, a challenge to the Xeno 2, so the XC Racer 2. So far, so good. We spent a uh, few months in Europe last last European summer and, and did a lot of testing uh, in competitions and XC flights and the glider. The glider is really comfortable and performs really well. Uh, yesterday, it was really good to have a chat with uh, Luke Brooks because uh, Luke Brooks was a really good thermometer of a, of a pilot that kind of uh, it's going to fly the XC Racer too. He he is stepping up from the uh, Fusion to the to the, to the XC Racer. Um, and the first END two lighter that he's ever flown was the XC Racer 2. Um, and he's put it a few hours now, and yesterday he flew for the first time the XC Racer 1, and I was chatting to him. And he did feel the differences between the two, and he thinks the XC Racer 2 is a, it's a better glider, it's more comfortable, it feels, feels nicer in the air. Uh, so it's good. good. It's good to have that feedback. And, and, I, do think, and I do think that the, the new generation of gliders are. It's another game chain, changing kind of gliders because they are they are more comfortable, uh, they are easier to fly, but they have more performance. They, they collapse less. They, they tend to collapse less because the, the airfoil is it's, it's more solid. We we are using this new generation of airfoils in our gliders now. That it's uh, yeah, I don't know. I think most brands are using those airfoils as well. And you can, you can notice in the high-end gliders, the gliders that you can use collapse lines to collapse the gliders, otherwise... Um, and that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting to topic to discuss as well. Um, the, the very solid FOs, why can't we use those FOs in, in lower-end gliders, you know? Um, yeah. So I hope I'm not, not, not going too far deep into some topics. So, um, yeah, so I'll leave, it, I'll leave it here for, for this. Uh, so we know. Oh, oh, we did. So um, this is our brand, um, the flow philosophy. I think the, the flow philosophy is to make uh, safe gliders that perform well. Um, that's the main goal. Uh, sometimes I can, I can, I can make, make gliders that, that can fly a little bit faster but I compromise a little bit safety, uh, especially in the airfoils, something that I work a lot and I, I prefer maybe to lose two kilometers an hour, whatever it is, at the top end on the high end gliders to have something that's safer that I know the pilots will fly and it's going to be safe, safe for them. So this is our whole, whole range, we have a yeah, yeah, glider which is the future, the cost is a low B, uh, the 3 2 has just been released is the high B, the panorama is also a B glider with the tender. Uh, the fusions, uh, the fusion one and the fusion is a ENC glider, the XC Racer 2 is factor 2 with the C, and then we have the PPG range, we have the Ioni. The Ioni 3 is also a, uh, it's here because it's 921, it's a shock and long test, it's a medium wing, it's the first glider flow uh, created, it was the Ioni 1, uh, before, before the XC Racer, the Cosmos, and everything else came. Uh, so we have the Cosmos Fire and the RPM uh, as a PPG 
go out of the RPM. Two days ago, a guy in Brazil, he flew 912 kilometers, he broke the Brazilian record, and then in Uruguay, so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a glider and it's designed as a, as a fishing cross-country type of PPG glider. Uh, and, and, and it's against competition, it's one of the most efficient PPG wings uh, on that speed, speed range when you fly with trimmers up and yeah, so, uh, people really like them, them, that, that, that glider for that purpose. And, and then just recently we have released the, the Future Power or VAA certification. Uh, so right now I'm working on the color over 2 and the color 2. Uh, and the oh, I just open if you guys didn't have any questions. With, with the RPM, what sort of top speed are you getting with um, trimmers out and speedlock? So the, the, the RPM is not the fastest uh, intermediate advanced, advanced glider, there's, there's yeah. just something that's faster there, but I think, I think depending on the wind loading, 70, 75 kilometers an hour, the 18, if someone has 80 kilos. Yeah, and yeah, last I mean, I, I've been flying the um, Hagon 3, mm. and you know, it says it's got a top speed of 72, but I've never got one. Right, yeah. But I'm, I'm on a point, I'm on the, the largest size because I'm in the wheelbase. Um, what, what wing, what size is the wing? It's the 24. 24. So yeah, I'd probably get that speed if you fly the 20 or the 18. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I, I just wanted to have a yeah, wing loading is um, it's, 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 it's a thing to consider in PPG. Um, but most people fly underneath the, the, um, the, the you know, my, mine's 130 to 170, but I know somebody who flies a 17 meter wing, he's yeah. 107 kilos plus a 30 kilo parameter. Yeah. But it's, he has to run at about 1,000 kilometers an hour just to take off. Just to take off. I've, I've broken props trying to take off on the 17. Yeah. <laughs> so you do have to run a lot of flyers, smaller flyers, yes. Yeah. And what's interesting making uh, PPG gliders is because it, it has opened my eyes to then, um, I don't know if you understand the technology of PPG gliders. Uh, when you fly a PPG, the geometry is complete, completely different. You fly very fast right. It's hard to look up and see the wing, and you have the torque of the engine. And, and if you fly in bumpy air, uh, it feels like you don't have total control of the glider if something happens up there. So the gliders have to be very, very collapsed in distance. Uh, most of them have, uh, in the past, they used, they, 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 they are the best ones that have a reflex wing, which then changes the CG forward and all the load is on the A-lines once you open the trimmers. Um, that, in combination with their foil, makes the glider super collapse resistant because all the load is on the A-lines. And I've, and I've introduced some of that te te technology into our free flying artists. Um, and that's, that's, that's my, in my point of view, it's a, it's a game changing uh, technology to have on, on, the, on the free flying artists as well. Especially when you fly, like a trim speed you don't notice, the, the, the load is kind of similar, the CG is at 50 percent, so the, all the lines are kind of even, even in tension. But once you use the speed bar, that's when you put the glider in an unstable, like not as a solid configuration that you would think, but with this technology, the glider actually becomes even more stable because it's shifting the CG forward and on the load, it's kind of on the A lines. Um, and if you think, I was, I was discussing with some of the pilots, um, it's incredible because you have, we have less collapses in flying in those extreme configurations, flying in and out of thermals. And what we came up with was if the other load is on the airline and you fly through the thermal, uh, it, that, that downdraft has to be actually stronger than the the, the free fall in speed because if, if the downdraft is coming down to collapse the glider and, you, and you're going to fall with it, the downdraft has to be kind of pretty strong, if you know what I mean. Because the overload is on the A lines, the support of the glider is almost on the A lines. And we notice that on the XC Racer 2, when you go pull it to pull it, there's almost no load on the, 
on the bees. Um, and talking to uh, pilots that fly different wings of the, the latest generations, they observe the same, the same thing. Uh, and so it's not something that's only happened with flow gliders, but it looks like uh, the uh, Iron gliders are having the same, the same behavior, the same, yeah, same feature, which is, you notice that a lot on the PPG gliders. Yeah. What are you trying to improve on the tandem wing? The tandem wing? Uh, so we get, the t I hear a lot of commercial pilots, the people that fly the, the gliders before I tackle a new project, I want to I hear them first. Now it's, now it's kind of, it's, it's a, we are in a really good position because we're trying to improve a previous glider. So, um, and then I talk to people in the ear what they, they have to say about like, hey, uh, the, the suggestions that they give. So the, the panorama has good landing, it has a really good inflation. We use the StarTex 32, it's one of the lightest uh, tendons in the market. It's only 6.7 kilos, and we're going to keep that, we're going to use the same construction. Uh, but what they say in comparison to all the tendons out there, it, that can, it can be a little bit more dynamic in the air, a bit more fun. You can bring over the pilots back to the fleet, so they can have fun with the commercial tendon. So that's, that's what, what we're kind of trying to achieve give it a little bit more uh, spicy, make it a little more sporty, I guess, in, in, in the air. But keep that nice launching and landing characteristics. Yeah. Um, so, I've noticed that uh, Fusion has a very specific weight range, like 72 to 92. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's that's a good question. Thanks. Um, when the glider was designed, um, it was designed to, for example, the small to be to, to the top of the range was ninety. And on the testing phase, uh, we just we started flying a little bit heavier, and we noticed that we can fly ninety five, and it's still flying well. Uh, so that's why. But I didn't want to I didn't want to go ninety five because I thought ninety five is kind of it's, it's, it's right at the top, you can fly and fly and not lose climbing ability. The glider becomes a bit more, you know, it's, it's higher wing load, it becomes a bit more sporty. But for the C class, which, and the glider was targeted to be like right in the middle, the middle of a classic C glider. So that's, we thought 92 is, is a good way, it's the top of the weight range. And then I understand, some, and some people sometimes ask, the question is like, yeah, you can fly the those gliders, the all the, the, the fusions three kilos above the wet range without losing any climb ability and, and not turning the glider more dynamic or anything. So that's why it was 92 rather than 90. Yeah. Just on that, um, going back to the tandems, so some tandems have a bigger range than others. The, fuse, the gym fuse screen starts at 90, whereas the magnum or any same size paragraph starts at 130. Is, are they just not testing that far down? I think so. I think so. Um, and, and, and that that was something that some pilots asked me. Uh, if you can, can you design, can you test, uh, can you certify like the, the gym fuse from night so we can, they can just keep, they can fly legally with kids the same line. And I think the, but sometimes, you have to make it a little bit heavier for the certification tests because sometimes if it's too lightly loaded, the glider will spin too easy in certain maneuvers, especially that maneuver where you collapse one side and you have to hold a uh, tendency to enter into a spiral dive and you might have to do a 360 on the other side. Um, and flying a glider that's lightly loaded, sometimes it's easier to, to spin. Because, um, and I think what how uh, the, the way that Jim got around of doing that, maybe because that glider, that it has a quite of a high trim speed. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, that's why some people really like that glider because it's very agile and dynamic in the air and really fun to fly. But it has does have a quite quite high trim speed. So are you saying that other manufacturers are actually testing the snow, or they just don't bother testing? I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I haven't tested that long, the Panorama one, uh, but it's something that I'm going to try for sure. Yeah.
Health yeah. testing work, do you say that like, I want to test it at this minimum weight range at this maximum weight range and that's all they do or you go down by 10, 10 kilo increments? So, the, uh, so when, when I, before we designed a glider, we do a little bit of research and wing loading and, and it's all like, okay, this glider was designed for this weight range. But during the testing phase, I do explore to go a little bit higher than what the glider was designed for and test and see how it's behaving. Because uh, there's a lot of try and error as well. Um, as well as the, the bottom of the red range. But uh, what I feel like is uh, it's something that I'm debating uh, to bring. Because uh, no one really flies the gliders at the front, at the very bottom of the red range. At least, at least not the solo gliders that I know that people fly at least it's seven, the two quarters up, right? That's a, that's a reference. And some companies now are uh, narrowing down the weight range by 10, 15 kilos for each size. And I think that's kind of something that I'm considering doing it. Yeah. So then you fly at that optimal weight range and apply it to the wire. Is there something you need to test yourself before you send it away with a server? Like, do you go out there at the specific way and do the test and see how well I can shoot past this way? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not an expert in, in doing the maneuvers for the certification, but some key tests I understand and I have a good understanding of how they should behave. Uh, and sometimes what dictates the bottom of the red range is how a glider uh, behaves after certain collapse. Yeah. There you go. <coughs> Yotam 2, um, now we're talking a heavier loader. How would that behave if you were trying to get it certified? Um, so the Yoli 2, now we have the Yoli 3. Uh, um, and go the 3. So it's, it's the, so the Yoli, it was designed as a strong wind soaring type of glider to fly the strong winds. So we use a very class resistant airfoil, uh, which is similar to the PPG gliders. And you, it's very rare to see a PPG glider certified to have an END, EN rating. And the yacht is the same. But um, if you were doing the test, how would it react? Uh, um, if your pull side collapse, you would collapse and you will boom, just like that. Certification likes gliders uh, that collapse and they go because sometimes they, they they tweak it the way they collapse it's it's done and so they, they wanted that specific recovery. They, those guys they pull collapse for reference. It's incredible. That's what they do every single day. It's <laughs> it's an interesting lifestyle. They <laughs> um, and they really understand how, how, how to pull it so it fits the criteria. And I think the Yodi, you would, you would decide class the front class, but some other maneuvers wouldn't pass. So I would have to, to have a yen, yen certification, I would have to change the effort. And, and I don't think I'm willing to do that. And because so I want to keep it solid because that, the climate was designed to fly in extreme air. I don't want to compromise the solidity, so I have a yen, a yen ready. So yeah. when you get an asymmetric frontal collapse on the Yoni 3, and if you react by just keeping it straight, um, then will it still like force you into the cliff? Or? So we have we have uh, real life videos of people having uh, collapses on the Yoni. Uh, leave a couple behind bushes and. They're like three meters off the ground, the guy collapses and reopens before he hit the ground. So there, there's no reaction, there's not enough reaction time for you to counter steer and wait for the glider to reopen because the glider is designed to do that. If it collapses, if there's still a little bit of air, cell air openings open, you're just going to reopen as a, uh, as a bang. Yeah. Yeah. And you see a little bit like that on the high end gliders these days as well. And, um, have you ever thought if you made a Yoti strong enough to be a parachute, whether it could be a parachute? Parachute? Yeah, like free fall cut up a parachute. I haven't uh, put a thought on that yet, but I think mm -hmm. it could be interesting. Yeah. I think the, 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 the skydiving uh, canopies are evolving to avoid it. Way. The tunnels looking like the apparently the airports, the, the new ones, mm -hmm. that do a lot of slop slooping. Yeah.
Do you want me to go through each one and then if you get any questions? Do well, 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 another question is um, in the tips of a wing, when you push on speed bar, the amount of twist and um, it looks like, in my opinion, some manufacturers um, cause the, like, slow the tips down when they're on speed bar and others um, keep the speed on. Yeah. And that's like a balancing act to meet the certification. So I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's, there's the optim, optimal aerodynamic uh, shape of a wing. Uh, and you observe that in nature and in scientific studies, uh, for an airfoil to be, for a gliding airfoil to be the most efficient, they have to have a bit of taper towards the tip to see birds and fish in, in, in nature, they have all their tapers. Uh, they also have what we call like a, a twist in the canopy in, in the wing, they have always wash up at the tips. So the, the um, Optimize the drag and uh, decrease the vortices on the tip stuff. But on the paraglider, we're very specific glider because they have all this arc and it's very hard to have one wash up. Um, but we can still put a little bit of twist in the canopy and we can still put a, sometimes even a negative angle of attack with tips. The tips are actually not generating any lift, they're just helping the wash up on the glider. But doing that make, it means that if you have a collapse, that side, that side is going to keep on flying and you have a tendency to enter rotation. The certification is much better to, to have the tips a little bit slow, so only when you have a collapse, that side won't have a tendency to dive, so it's going to be kind of slow. Um, so it's, 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 a try, it's a try and error. Uh, we have to do a little bit of trying to find that compromise. We don't want to slow it down as much, too much because then we're losing performance and we're losing a little bit of the handling. Um, and if we don't want to make it too fast, so it's too dynamic and it's also good for certification. We can get away sometimes with the high end gliders to have a high end of attack on the tips, and that's what we do. Um, and over time, I realized that we can optimize the glider for speed and without worry about certification, because what happens is you do. To get a glider certified, you see the test, they do a trim speed and do a, a speed, a full speed. Uh, and when you do a full speed, they pull collapse and they come off the, off the bar and they, they wait the, the glider to recover at trim speed. But they only pull the collapse at the speed. Uh, so at that configuration, the glider can be optimal, optimal for gliding. Um, and you can design the risers and the attachment points on the canopy to match that, to match what, to, to do what it wants without worrying too much about uh, how it's going to recover at full speed because you come off bar as soon as you pull lines. And in, that, in, natural, in, in real life, that's what you do as well, right? You never, you never uh, pull collapse and, and stay on full bar, like half bar, like almost come off bar at the lines. Well, with your Freedom um, 2, you have well, basically three weight ranges, which means that if you're kind of stuck in the middle, it precludes, where the other manufacturers seem to have about five weight ranges which cater and overlap quite, quite a bit. So the Freedom 2? Yeah. yeah. So the, yeah, we have four sizes to cover from, I think, the bottom of the weight, the weight range of the small is so the freedom we kind of to expand a little bit so we can get a bit back we should make smaller gliders so, you know uh, certified up to 75 that we don't have uh, so we try the, the, the freedom I think is from 60 that's the bottom of the weight range of the small 60 to 80 and then you know, yeah, the small. Yeah. And well, I sit right at 105 so it's kind of at the very top or the very bottom, which makes you ah, I know what you mean. Yes. then then you start going, you know, I had to look at gliders which put me in the middle of the weight range and you yeah. know that left me having a look at certain gliders other than Yeah, yeah. Which kind of make, makes you 
That's right. So there's always a compromise. We're trying to kind of have the sizing that kind of fit all the parts. But I understand that there'll be there'll be some parts that won't fit in one or the other, and it'll be right in the middle. Um, and that's something that we can't avoid. The only way to avoid that, I think, is to make more sizes and have the, the, the overlapping. Yeah. Um, why is it that some um, lower rated gliders can be twitchier than a higher rated glider, even if the sizes are even if the sizes are the same? Mm. So you might get an, an ENA that's actually twitchier than, a, say, a high B. What determines uh, you mean you're comparing the same weight range or yes. you're comparing the smaller sizes? No, same weight range. Yeah. Is, is there anything uh, in a design of a paradigm that makes one move to achieve Yeah, so, <laughs> so this, this, is a, this is a really interesting topic and something that I'm a little bit passionate about because um, they ask uh, like-minded designers like me that like to design gliders that are more solid and, and, and we personally think the, uh, the glider design has evolved but certification hasn't. Um, and we think that we could use different airfoils in the lower end gliders and the way the certification is now, it only measures the recovery after collapse and it was the the parameters were, they were established in a time when the gliders were very different from today. And it's and for the EMA glider, for example, to recover in a certain way, we have to use a glider that's very easy to collapse because that's how they want the recovery to be. Because sometimes, so if you have a glider that has more internal pressure, and as soon as you collapse, you want to reopen, and you doing the test at speed, we're trying to rock it a little bit um, and that angle is very important for certification um, and, but if you have a, a glider that collapses but it recovers in a very gentle way it doesn't have much of that aggress aggress aggressiveness um, and it's better for certification that's why I think sometimes um, EMB gliders can be safer than EMB gliders just because the airfoils that we use um, on the ENA EN gliders, and we can get away of using uh, maybe a little bit more collapse resistant uh, effort on the big glider. So you just said EM, EMB, some EMB gliders can be safer. I can, yeah, yeah. But you know, it's a certification, I mean, that's, that's your perception as well, right? You think the EN, ENA can be a bit more twitchy? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So for me personally, I have a relatively low. Bump tolerance. Now, can I actively can pilot an ENC wing? Absolutely, my eyes closed. Yeah. But I would rather fly a less bump. Yeah. Bump. So I think I think um, when there's more voices uh, exposing this, maybe then we can then change the certification a little bit. Like we see now, uh, we are allowed to use collapse lines again for the ENC class. Uh, but there's a lot of voices saying that no, we can't use collapse lines on the B, the B class. Uh, I'm all for it, uh, but there's a lot of people against, so yeah, we'll see what the future brings. Yeah, yeah we started, uh, we have uh, a few prototypes, we have three prototypes that uh, um, started doing so 2019, before it was even ready, was, uh, there was a talk of, I think they're going to allow the NC class, the NC class, so I wanted to get ready, um, and so I had to start making some prototypes. Um, there was a lot actually, the Nick Niners was flying for quite a while, um, and we were going to certify their glide for the X-Ups, but it didn't happen. Um, but we, I feel that we're kind of, we're kind of ready with that glide, a few glide is, is finished, is good. Um, but we, I have to think strategically in terms of production. So I have all these gloves certified first, and then I'll bring up the ENC, which uh, I'm planning to do for next year. Yeah, um, I have just recently. Also, Flow has a new 
the factory, we are now uh, all what is now uh, introduced in, uh, in Sri Lanka. We used to have a factory in Thailand. Uh, but it was very difficult and complicated to deal with those guys because they didn't allow, didn't offer us more capacity for make, to make lives expand as a brand. Uh, so that's why we now have a uh, factory in Sri Lanka. They have much easier, much nicer, much better conditions. So um, it will be easier to release new lives in the future. I mean, if there's a demand, because ah, that's, that's what I'm passionate about, why is to create new uh, groundbreaking kind of blinders and explore new technologies. Like the, the, the freedom, the, the Fusion was the first ever hybrid 3 to 2 liners, and you know, having, uh, having uh, one less cascade on the glider means a lot less drag, and, and when you're wide, you can see that the translation it, it forms in wide angle and see other brands now so you buy their gliders as a as a hybrid as well. Um, and I think that was kind of it's 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 slow moving evolution, isn't it? I think that breakthrough in technology allowed as well for people perceptions like, oh maybe if that glider is certified as a C maybe you can start certifying two two liners as a C. So I think it's part of the whole process to bring this sport forward and it's it's great. Right. Just one of the when you say you've got the factory, how many gliders do you actually produce? Yeah, so uh, we getting close to a thousand, one thousand per year. Yeah, that's how kind of our number our go. Yeah, I understand some of the manufacturers make more, others less, but some like the big brands, the big players, they, they do way more than a thousand a year. Yeah. But we are. Kind of steady, steady, healthy growth, which is good. Is the new factory, does that give you um, access to new material or new processes that you did previously? They make it easier for me to access them, much easier. The other one was very reluctant for me to access those. Yeah, for example, you know, rods, now I can use it like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, kind of, nice. yeah, yeah, we have a, we have a designer working on harnesses. Um, I have a picture here. He's a very talented guy. This is our very interesting thing too. I should just go through here. Take okay, series two. So that kind of you can have colors. Two. You know you. You know you like. So this is our harness. It seems it's a work in progress. Uh, we have some we have prototypes being flown. Um, and the goal is to have it finished next year. It's not like a full long race harness, but more like an XC kind of harness around five kilos. What's the weight going to Around five kilos. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's here the ENT two liner. Uh, yeah, and that, this model was the first one that I introduced with this new F1 that I'm uh, now using all the new high end gliders. Uh, it was it was a it was a true research uh, kind of project because it was inspired by the F1 was used on the PPG gliders, and I wanted to see if that F1 gave me the glide, um, and it did. Very, very solid, which is amazing. Yeah. So, reflex in it or? So, so before the invention of the shark nose, to make a PPG water very solid, you have to have reflex, which is the forming the camber, a uh, profile camber of the water. So, um, and put it on the low and lines. But with the new shark nose, Technology and the top, the combination of the top and bottom contours and shapes of the profile, we can design a glider that you don't need to, to form the FOM anymore, but be pitch stable uh, and function in the same way as a uh, profile, uh, a reflex profile, and be efficient. The problem with the 
uh, reflex profiles that they become very inefficient and you have to use a lot of throttle. That's why it was only used in the GPG wings. Uh, now you can see uh, new PPG gliders. They are very efficient, even on an extreme angle of attack. So that's 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 that's, that's um, so that's why I thought oh, that F1 could be used uh, really well on the, uh, the three-point gliders. Half the small with the tweaks. Yeah. You said the reflex wing becomes inefficient when? Uh, if, if, you, if you use it on a three point, it, they, they're very, oh, they're very inefficient. They use, yeah, they, yeah. Traditional, a traditional reflex wing is very inefficient. It has a very poor line. Yeah. And do you measure the whole arc curve of your gliders? Yeah, we, we, we try. Yeah. And then you just keep it secret? Oh, it's some for the high-end gliders that people need, we keep we, we keep to the pilots and the their, their instruments. Because it's something, it's difficult to do it because it depends on the, uh, the atmospheric pressure and wig loading and it's, it's, there's going to be a lot of tests to, to get the proper glide. Yeah. That's why most manufacturers don't, these days, don't, they, they, don't, they don't release the sink rate and the glide angle because there's so many variables. Yeah. Yeah. With the two liners, is it something that you could bring further down the line, like to the freedom? Um, or is it not possible to do that? I think once you have, uh, for example, the big gliders they have a very long cord, and it's hard to support that long cord with two attachment points only. Uh, but I don't rule it out, really rule it out. Maybe there's, uh, maybe there's tweaks and things that we can do to offer support for that cord. Um, definitely on the C, on the C class, because the cord is not that high. But I think that's something maybe the designers will start exploring for the, for the B class. Yeah, it's interesting. Maybe if we split up the B attachment points a bit, a bit wider in the A's as well. We see, we see uh, B gliders with 6.0 aspect ratio, maybe that, that's kind of the direction, maybe. Um, yeah. So David uh, said that uh, most of you guys are going to go to 12, maybe to a lot of half an hour. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, so I can, I can also show a little bit of the design software that I use to design the gliders. And I'll show, I can show one of our gliders. I'll try not to show too much because it's video recording. I don't, I don't want to... <laughs> I can turn the recorder off. No, that's okay. Um, maybe I should show um, some amazing stuff. Yeah. Instead of recording, we want to see everything. Oh, Mister. How big is the team? So, so the, the, we have a very small little team. Um, we have two people in the office, and then myself as a designer. And we have people, local pilots, that help us designing, like testing the gliders. Uh, Shane, Shane helps. Uh, Johnny gives some good feedback, and other pilots, you know, kind of the uh, Dave, yeah, all those guys. And, and I think this is a uh, what I like the most is to when I, the glider is finished, there's a, the, 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 the core flow pilots, you know, the, the one, um, I'm always the one to fly the glider first, and once, well, if it's a new prototype, um, if the glider feels safe and feels finished, and then I start giving to the core pilots, the core flow pilots, and, and giving to other pilots, because what I feel, it's like, and so, sometimes I offer to normal pilots who are not team, uh, test pilots, to fly the glider, it's like, they, they say, they come back to me, it's like, oh, but I, um, I'm not a test pilot, I don't know. I don't know how to transmit information, give feedback. It's like, just fly and see what you think. And sometimes they give me a little hint because it's something that I'm feeling, but I'm not 100% sure. And they, and they are the pilots who will be flying those gliders, right? Those are, those are the pilots who are in, the gliders intended to. And they give me that feedback that I'm thinking about, like, yeah, this is very valuable. Um, sometimes it emphasizes a, 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 a good, point on the glider and sometimes emphasizes something that's not so good so then I go back to the drawing board and do new prototypes. Um, but the good thing is 
because now I've been making so many prototypes. All the parameters that I have here on the design, as I'm, uh, on the design, I'm, I'm pretty happy to to fly into the very thermic air on the first slider, on the first prototype, uh, because because I know it's going to fly well because the parameters are all down pat, all, all, all pretty, pretty well sorted. Um, and and I noticed the last, the latest prototypes, if there's not too much groundbreaking technology, uh, there's very small tweaks to be done. Yeah. I, um, I tend to spend a lot of time on the computer, getting things everything sorted for new prototypes made. So this is the software I make, um, um, and it's, the, it's called the Glider Plan. It's made, um, it, it's, it's used by most of the manufacturers in the industry. Uh, and the interesting thing is that um, the guy who makes them is it's it's an Aussie guy based in Brisbane. Oh, Brisbane, yeah. So this is the Panorama 2. Um, so the, the good thing is when, you, when we design the glider, um, it's all in 3D, you can see in real time, I can play with the colors, I can play with the arc, I can play with everything. Um, so. See, uh, when you come to design a new glider, what's the very first thing you start with on the program? Um, so before, before I design a new glider, I do, I do a lot of research. I do, um, I, I, I want to know what, if it's, if it's an evolution, let's say the Panorama 2, I, I wanted to know what I need to improve on this glider. Uh, and then I work on the, on the version, the prior version. If it's a brand new glider, then then I do a lot of research about the, that uh, glider that I wanted to design, and um, and I probably started with the outline first, and then the arc, and the number of cells, and start. You, and then they go to the the line plan, um, and that's how it, it's. And it's, to me, it's, it's super fascinating because it's almost like a puzzle. You start it and, and you, you're solving a, a problem. Not, not, it's not a problem, but are you trying to put everything together, everything, that, everything that comes along as, 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 as a whole, as one. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you have these crazy ideas that you want to make it something get there, but um, the, the design process of a new glider, it's, it's always better to do one thing at a time and, and document it all, every little change, so you know what every change is doing to a glider before you get where you want it to, to go. Because if you, if you make a prototype right there, you don't know what, you know what the, how the process is like, how you got there, and how to replicate that change on all the future projects. So that's why I kind of trying to do little by little. Um, so the, the, when I, um, so I, I also work a lot on the internal structure. This is a, a more simpler internal structure there on the, on the panorama because there's not too many unsupported cells. There's a section here that you have, this, see there? There's three unsupported cells. Some gliders have five, so there's they have a very uh, uh, um, complex internal structure. It's the airfoil, the cell openings. Um, How long does it take to run a simulation, and, and what kind of how good is the output? Like the output you get from the simulation. So James is the one that does all the simulations. He's done it for the. For the Spectre 2, when I was wanted to do the Spectre, the UFO for the Spectre 2. So he, he can answer that. It, depending on the computer power you have, right? Yeah, depends on the computer. Yeah. Yeah. Is that maybe the simulation? Maybe the Because this is, it's, it's, it's a designing tool. It's, it's, it's my pencil. You know, it's, it doesn't run any simulations, but I can generate all the 3D plans yeah. to then take it to CFD. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah so um, that's uh, that's basically it. Yeah. Could you just 
do any wind tunnel testing or anything like that? I noticed on the gym for the, the rooms for they had some wind tunnel testing with smoke streams and lasers and all sorts of cool looking things. Um, not for the for the gliders, mm -hmm. um, but for our harness, yes. Uh, uh, Buckley has run safety through that harness, and he did change a few things uh, after he got the results. He changed the, the shape of the fairing and the shape of the flight the flight deck as well. So he's doing trying to do something different with the flight deck. I don't know if you've seen it, um, yeah. that triangular kind of shape, a little bit different from the others. That the, the flight deck is offering uh, almost like the the, 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 the screen screen that you know that's without the wind screen, just the shape of the, the fairing over the air or the helmet. Um, yeah. And um, you would have seen the flare mustache gliders that are now for the bridle different control systems. Yes. Do you think that has any application in you know, soaring paragliders or you know, free flying? What, what, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't think it works for a two-liner, but for maybe a three or even the, earth, the lower end ones, it might, might be more efficient. I, th I think it's, it's very interesting. And, I, and, I, and you know, um, kudos for those guys to, to be the first ones to do it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's not a new technology. They just brought uh, that, techn from, that technology from the kite surf, kite surfing, the foil kites to the paragliding world, uh, because the way the risers work on the foils is the same concept. You have I don't know if you guys are kite surfers, but uh, in the kiting you have a harness, and you have the center lines connected to the harness, and you have the bar, and you pull the bar in, you change the angle attack, you pull the bar out, and you you accelerate the, the car. And it's exactly the same what the moustache guys did, which is bringing that, uh, they call it a mixer, to a paraglider. But to do that, you have to have the attachment points on the canopy that can match that reduction of the rises. And traditionally, on a paraglider, you have a 66% reduction between A and B. Uh, but on the on the on the four parts, you have a 50 50 percent, which is kind of similar to what I use on the fusion. There's a more efficient way to change the angle of attack. Um, and in fact, I'm actually um, very interesting to explore that concept in our own glider. So there's prototypes. This is this is one that's coming, um, and it's uh, it's going to come with a similar similar rises. So I just want to explore and um, and. It's one of those things that I mentioned before. Um, it's when you combine the, the new PPG efficient F foils um, with with the the, the, the mix of the you know the, the, the rises they have. We have. That's what they have. It's it's brilliant. Yeah. And I think maybe in the future, I don't know, it could be interesting, right? Like a normal size paraglider with that technology. Yeah. But with that flow. Um, Paradigm. I was watching them on the, the coast and, and they oh, asked me to have a, a flight and I shit myself and I said no basically because you, you basically start with full reflex yeah. and then you add brake as you pull down. Yeah. Yeah, so you change the airfoil completely. Yeah. And they were just filming. Yeah, I think it's more uh, it's more for the advanced for the advanced pilot. I don't think it's for everyone. But as any as anything, they're the first the first branch to introduce that. Maybe other guys can come and put more thought and do something that's more user friendly. Because um, it's like going there with, with my paramount and putting the trimmers all the way out. Yeah, but it, but it, but the trimmers are there, right? Um, yeah. It's like hang glider. You know, you, you, you change the angle attack constantly in the swoops and turns. Um, yeah, I think I think that's probably going to gain more space in our sport, and that's what I kind of envision. Yeah, that's why I'm really keen to explore that technology. Another question on the 
positioning of breaks and rises relative to the polar curve. You, many years ago when we started, um, like best glide was like some breaks. And now best glide is normally hands up. Hands up, yeah. So um, could you tell, tell us about the change in, and where the points on the polar curve, like where minimum sink would be and so on? Yeah, I think because maybe the, the gliders these days have more internal structure, they have less lines, so they more they have less drag, and the problem with the FOs are designed in a way to work at optimal without any modification in, in the camera. So if you, um, if you apply a little bit of break, you are changing the angle of attack a little bit, but you're creating a lot more drag. Um, and, and sometimes it's better just to leave the airfoil undisturbed just the way it was designed to be so you have the, be the best light and the best mean sink um, sometimes you just have a little bit of break you have better, better sink rate um, but most light yeah. and what's the difference between using the C handles compared to using the brakes to try and get rid of them sink. So if the C handles are only changing the angle of attack, it's much better to do that because then you still have a clean F or you don't you're not creating more drag on the trailing edge. Um, because if you are just using the brake and you change the camera, you create a lot more drag. Glide the, the F four becomes less efficient. And so do you yeah. suggest like if I'm coastal soaring wanting to get the absolute maximum height? trying to get minimum sink, then using a little bit of C handles. Hmm. Uh, probably, probably a little bit of break, because you have mean sink. It's not about glide, it's about mean sink there, is there? Yeah. Well, the, uh, on the outer level, the, the same topic, on the outer level, it used to be like a really short, um, what do you call it? Trimus? Trimus, that's right. Is there any possible possibility to introduce a trimmer which is actually only slow down the body, not speeding up, not opening up, but just slow down in the thermal because it was great? Yeah, um, I think level. I did have a Yodi, the Yodi one had that, but uh, the problem is not every pilot understands the concept. Uh, they don't understand that even if it's on, if it's on the manual or the website, the gliders should be should be flown at never at negative angle of attack, you know, to slow it down, you only slow it down for, for a specific purpose, for thermally, or if you want to scratch, if you're scratching all the reach on the coast, and you stay airborne. But some people forget about it, and they, 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 it will be easy to install it, so that's why I stopped, I stopped using that, 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 that concept, just, yeah, safety. But, but it, it, it works, yeah, it, it does work. Is it, is it possible to, without actually uh, changing certification, to uh, fit the trimmers on, on the wire? Um, the reason why you don't see is because you would require a full set of uh, new flight tests if you introduce trimmers. Trimmers out, open, you have to do trimmers no, and no. neutral. I'm talking about slow down, just to work the trimmers on the normal riser and uh, on the top of normal riser just to slow it down instead of pull, pulling the brakes in the thermal so create an extra drag and losing performance but if if if, if you want to introduce those trimmers then you have to test the glider with the trimmers the configuration you want to, to for the glider to be certified if you can introduce the trimmers to any glider then the glider will become uncertified would yeah. it be a di difficult to pass through the test if Probably, the slow probably then you, you have to retrim the glider completely. I don't, I don't know, to, I haven't tested it. You'd have to travel out of the speed line as well, right? because you've got that limitation of the camera. Yeah. Of That's why it was only, uh, all, only used on the only class gliders, because it was yeah. basically required. Uh, how do you know it's not good? Tendons, you have to have a tendon sometimes, you see on tendons, a little bit like negative. Yeah, so they would have like many of the trimmers, you know, with like an open source of the animal for something. Yeah, just 
But the interesting thing is sometimes, um, I noticed with the uh, this spectra, uh, people are blind is not climbing so well. And naturally, you would think I have to slow it down. But sometimes speeding up the bike gives a bit more bite more energy and it's converted as little bubbles better and climbing better after we speed the bike up. Would you, would you uh, have a trimmers for the test protogliders to adjust it while you fly in? Maybe? Yeah, I had for the two liners when I was doing the XC racer. Yeah. But then uh, after, uh, in, uh, after I had all the parameters right and uh, the, the correct trim speed, I didn't bring them up anymore. But it's very handy to have a test. The young. Uh, how it behaves hitting the bumps and so on. Um, so the fusion, for example, the difference between a normal weight glider and a lightweight glider, what do you find? I think the lightweight glider is more alive, like more lively. You feel, you feel a bit more. Um, <coughs> would it be less efficient through those little bumps? I think it would become more efficient because more efficient. it's less, less uh, inertia. So you would uh, pitch less, right? You hit a little bump, in the world, the amplitude of the pitch would be less so you have your glider. So you think in, in those little bumps it may be more efficient? The lighter the, the, the glider, the better. Yeah, yeah. because it's less inertia. Yeah. Well, what, what's the length of the, the, uh, the livability of the cloth in the two difference? You know, you're going to have the, the, the heavier glider is always going to last that yeah. little bit longer. Yeah, I think there was the, 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 the worst thing for like highway cloth, let's, let's talk about the 20, the uh, sky, well, it's high tech 27 grams is humidity, but if you fly in, like, if you fly in land, um, Jan Tupi had a guy and he flew for 600 hours, he's in you know, one, and it's made with sky tech 27, so it, yeah, it's still, it's last as, last as long as a normal, normal cloth if you take good care of it. Yeah. So they're extremely durable, the lightweight cloth. They, they last, um, I guess, the version can have rocky takeoffs. Uh, maybe they won't last as long, but if you only take taking off and landing on grass, uh, yeah, it should last as long as the normal weight cloth. The length of the lines, does that just depend on the arc of the glider? Yeah, yeah. So you can't make shorter lines because the arc's just too. That's right, and then there's. If you make a short and like you bring the arc down like that, you have probably the, the handling would be nice for turning, it would turn nicer, but you have a when you go in nose down spiral, sometimes it stays on that nose down spiral, and you have to find a compromise. If it's too flat, it's kind of we have better glide, um, with a bit more line consumption, uh, turning won't be as good, uh, be really good for that. For the ENA class and the ENA, ENA class, you see a lot of ENA gliders were very, very flat just because of the spiral dive maneuver for certifications. Uh, it has, you can enter a spiral dive and you have to look heads up, the guy has to come up by itself. Uh, I was wondering if there's a way of getting the pilot closer to the wing. So I do play with that as well, so I bring the <laughs> spiral dive. <laughs> Yeah, so you'd be gliding at speed bar, 
Yeah, I mean, when it gets really rough, I tend to go off that. Okay, so on a two line, it's definitely a little bit of, little bit of buy and control the glider with re-rise of steering. Uh, that's why there's a lot of a lot of manufacturers that are exploring uh, the riser geometry, where you can fly with re-riser, which are very efficient rather than deforming the profile, which is changing the angle of attack. I naturally, if I fly an EMB glider like the Freedom 2, and I um, and I leave the thermal, I find a little bit of roughness, I use a little bit of bar and I fly the glider with rough air. Yes. But if it's really, really rough, I come off and then I, yeah, to see if it's gonna. But I tend to not touch the brakes if, if you feel that you have a quality on the rear risers to catch collapse. Do you, do you feel on your glider that if you're gliding, you leave the thermal and you glider, you encounter some rough, rough air, and if you if you eventually have a deflation, you can catch it with your re-riser. Uh -huh. Sometimes, sometimes a re-riser can be very efficient, and you can catch any deflation. If you see it, you if come down. Yeah. So naturally, I think most instructors will say, "Come off by and then fly actively." Right. That's that's how, what they have to do. It's on the fusion. On the fusion. Yeah. The fusion you can catch, any collapse. And by my own experience in further pilots flying, um, anyone that's flown the fusion caught any collapse of flying re rises? Yeah. Yeah? You can use both, but if you're on bar, you can use your legs too, so it is best to go to the top of bar and catch with the reasons that's important. So, so that's why the reason that that's why the fusion was designed that way. It was it, it's heavy on the re riser, but it's very efficient. It's, it acts the same way as the two liners. So if you do encounter, you glide and you feel that, you know that it's gonna collapse. You just you can be either one, both, or on one. You can be aggressive, come and back, and you catch that, and you and you keep on gliding. The fusion is very very active, active on, on, on re rises. It's exactly the same way as the two liner. Yeah, you don't need to come come off. Come off the bar and use the brakes. You can fly actively on the rear riders. The wooden there. Okay. The Freedom is the same. It's a little bit lighter because it has an extra pulley. So when you pull the rear risers, it's lighter, but it's as efficient as a fusion. Yeah. Yeah. Any comments um, around transitioning from a three one to a two one? Relax. So yes. Who is your um, most beginner friendly two line targeted at? Yeah, so the, 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 the Accelerator 2 is, is, is the next step up from the Fusion. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it, it is a little bit of a gap, but with the, with the Accelerator 2 being so easy to fly, and, and um, you know, we have, we have a local pilot here, Luke, um, he felt that he was ready to fly the Accelerator 2. Even the glider is not fully certified yet. He's been flying, and he's, he's fully comfortable. So for he, for him, the transition was easy. He didn't feel there was uh, more workload. He didn't feel he would be intimidated by the glider by the extra aspect ratio. For for him, it was it was easy. Uh, but if you have a NC2 liner, uh, maybe that's kind of a less of a step up. Uh, yeah, I think. It's an individual thing. You you naturally be drawn to if, it, if it's your ambition to fly that glider, you'd be naturally be drawn to that. I think the first few flights you probably feel a little bit um, yeah, just adapting to that extra step ratio. But I think if you're coming from that NC NC you've flown quite a few hours, that's that's that's, that's the how the tra the transition has always been. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'll wrap it up. It, oh, you guys don't have any more questions? Oh, I was going to ask about the, I mean, the factory. I mean, how many people there are working there? It's been set up the factory and then you come to the second. Yeah, so we use OEM factories. They are already set up to receive uh, manufacturers. So they, 
um, I'll, I'll talk about the, um, so I used to use the factory in Thailand. They also make gliders for all the brands. Um, and it was just time for me to leave and go, go somewhere else because we wanted to expand. And then um, I'm in Sri Lanka now. Um, and it's a very well established factory. They have, uh, they have 2,000 workers there. Um, but they also make kite surfing kites. Um, and it's a big production line. They have, it's, it's, it's imagine like a, a like a year navel art is not too complex. Uh, you kind of can put your head around. But a, a VGD glider, for example, which has so many colors, is, it's a puzzle, right? Put all the colors together, and you have to have a system in place, so it's, it's all the same. Um, and it's amazing to, to, to see them doing that, because um, a same seamstress will only do one little part of the glider. So you probably want to have a, a concept how the full glider looks like, in the end, I think probably she does. Uh, but from every day, day in, day out, just doing that little diagonal, for example, and she gets really good at that. And then she understands uh, every time there's a different glider coming, she will do that part. You know, um, I think that's how it works. And there's a guy from each section. There's a guy moving the parts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 and, and it was even though there was a. The, the factories are in a different country, they will run very sim similar ways. Yeah, the small little things they do differently, but they were very, very similar. They, they work at a very um, easy pace, they're not rushing. Um, yeah. Think, uh, yeah. So just about the, the, the graphics, does the complexity of the design of the wing adds more weight or structural difficulties in building? So the BGD is full of little patches of fabric. Yeah, so each panel, every time you add a new color, you, you make an extra panel. And each panel around that panel has a 10 millimeter uh, sealing allowance. So you add a little, a little bit more cloth. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it's um, still relevant, I don't think. I think there's a compromise. If you go too much, too much, but if you... Yeah, you want the glider to be pretty and colorful as well, you know. Um, yeah, some, but like sometimes you have on the leading edge, you have extra cells, so you either uh, over here, um, so it's, so you see this, um, so the 3D shape after the panels are cut, uh, they, look, uh, they, look, they look a bit better. So you can see it there. distortion. You see the, the, the guys who fly at PwC level, they think the glider that has more than 100 hours won't perform as well because the, the, tech, the materials have, have stretched. Um, Is there any uh, research done into what could be done to stop it from happening? Or uh, there are different materials? I think that the physical is two uh, brands that we use for making cloth, Dominico and Skypex. Um, and depending on your application, depending on what water you're using, that uh, uh, every plot or uh, will have less or, or more stretch. Um, but if there's something you can do, if the, 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 every manufacturer uses the same materials, and they have over time, they, they, they stretch, they stretch a little bit over time. Yeah. They deform, they stretch. Yeah. A little bit, not much. Still, you can still fly a lot. We don't see as much here people doing a lot of checks, but in Europe uh, we have it's mandatory. I think New Zealand as well. We have to do it once every two years, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to do it every year, one year. Well, every year, yeah. yeah. So it's a check for us to see and, and to restrict the lot of 
with the body. Yeah. The um, trim on the gliders, some manufacturers put loops that you take out after a period of time. That's your view on stretching the lines and so on. Yeah, so the ship, the ship lines that we're using now, the high end ship lines we have, even on EMB gliders, um, or on ship lines, um, especially the Anima lines, they, they shrink over time. And the reason why the loops are there is so you can compensate, release the loops to bring the line back to the original length. Yeah, it's very important. It's very important to keep the glider uh, a trim. There's uh, manufacturing, manufacturing specifications. Uh, yeah, so that's what I think the loops are just make life for us a bit easier. And so, do you have loops on your gliders? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, how long before you recommend the trim? Um, around 100 hours, 60 to 100 hours to do the first check, depending on the glider. Uh, for the for the, the spectra and the X eraser uh, yeah. yeah. So time on the X eraser the wiring, what sorts of time for checking? Time for checking. Uh, so I advise after twenty hours to release some loops. Uh, to the spectra to the yeah, yeah, so it's instruction that I give for all the dealers when they sell those lights. Uh, yeah. So it's a two liner, so there's a lot of load on the A lines. Uh, and a lot of the B lines, so, so, so few lines. And what happens is in the first 20 hours, the A lines will stretch. It will stretch difficultly, but the glider will, will come out of three very quickly after the first 20 hours. After 20 hours, everything is embedded in and, and it becomes more stable, so then you can release uh, some loops to bring the glider back to specs. Um, for the Fusion, for example, I, 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 I uh, ship the glider six mules faster. Uh, then the trim. So for the first 20 hours, you probably find a lot of it's a little bit faster than it's supposed to be. But for some people, it's unnoticeable. But after 20 hours, the glider becomes back to trim. That's kind of yeah, back to my face. So it's it, on the three line is a little bit more complicated to release the, the loops and keep that uh, profile attached. The profile, so that's why it comes in that, that way. On the Freedom 2, the front line, A line, you have a little V at the top, and I see a little picture explaining how it helps your um, tucking and keeping the angle of attack. Yeah, so that, that was a, that's, a, that's a really interesting concept that we have on the. I'll try to, try to use my point. So we have the A lines that they split up in two on the high end gliders. Um, and if, you glide, if the glider is on the, on the Freedom 2, if the glider is laid out uh, and you have a line that's attached to the cell opening, closer to the cell opening, it's much easier to pull to inflate the glider. But, so there's that's going to be more bias on this line for inflation. And when, a, when you fly a trim, the load is spread evenly on the eight, for the glider's fine this way. But you're changing the angle of attack and the load is transferred to the rear line, so you have a bigger distance from here to there. It makes just by doing that makes the uh, the linear a little bit more solid, and the way the CG is also changed. Uh, in this line, this line almost becomes because that's a little bit less load. Uh, so that was a very simple solution to increase solidity of the glider at the full bar on the EMB glider. It was, it was a really good solution. Yeah, very simple. Uh, I'm all up for the um, simpler solutions. I don't like things that are overly complicated. But sometimes to think to give simpler solutions, you have to think in a very sophisticated way. It's not so easy. It's, it's much easier to add a lot of things to get what you want. But if you want to get there, you can go in a simple way to make it. You know, that's kind of the approach I uh, like. I like to take uh, when designing the globalize. Make it. Simpler, sometimes adding a lot of things looks very sophisticated and complex, but sometimes that's what is yeah. Any uh, your, your 32 meter tandem wing, how recently did you release that? Is that, is that, is it any precedent? So the, the sort of thing like a tandem wing. Yeah, so it's exactly, it's a tandem wing. So first the 41 and 39 came up, and 
there was one brand only that's kind of a lot of people were using it was the mini little part mini wing yeah. uh, for for tendons for when you use a smaller tendons usually for the, when the wing's strong uh, so that's why that, that's how that, that's 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 what we decided to do release a tendon that was specifically designed to be flown at strong wings. Um, and we use a completely different airfoil, uh, similar airfoil to the Yoni. Quick airfoil so they can tolerate extreme air. Um, so it's more solid, more collapse resistant. Um, and it's used, most, most commercial guys are using it, they really like it for the tendon with the strong wings. Okay. The patterns that you use, um, say for example, um, the Freedom 2. How, how, it's pretty new, but how often would you find they get bent or broken if you did? Like, is it okay they use a stuck sack? Yeah, okay, so um, on the Fusion, you see there's, it's, there's, a two, there's two types of battens or uh, rods that we use. One is a transparent one that's, that's stiffer. Uh, it doesn't hold, uh, and it has a memory, so if you, if you bend it, you keep bent, it will be bent forever in a way. But the orange that we use in certain section of the glider, um, it doesn't hold memory at all. So especially uh, on this, the, on the fusion on the freedom, it, this is the two liner section of the glider, and the orange rod goes all the way almost to the tree and it stops here. Um, and when you're folding, uh, even on a Constantino band or a compression bag, that section is going to be folded. Sometimes with uh, with big things, big big fold, like extreme, um, yeah, folding, um, and it's it's okay. It doesn't hold me over, so you can fold it like that. And so uh, for the fusion, for example, would it be okay just to use the stash bag? Like yeah, um, yeah. As long as you, I prefer to ask people to Constantina because. This rod here is the stiff one, and they are very important. Um, and if you just put in the start sack, and so be, yeah. that little one is that also in the Freedom 2? Yeah, the Freedom 2 is the same, yeah. yeah. And especially on the Freedom 2 because uh, this is where you have the split ace, um, and you want this to be clean because there's a bit of a, a curvature on the bottom. Of the airfoil, we want to keep that clean. That's what gives this pitch stability. Yeah. And, and pitch stability is something that I really take care of all floor gliders. Um, I think it's something very important and safe to have a pitch to have in the gliders. The glider that's somehow pitch stable doesn't oscillate as much. Yeah. I am. I actually raced two, which is done a few hours now. Never used folding below with it. It's always just folding completely in half. There's no deformation at all. So it's going to ask for full weight buttons. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, especially if we have the orange ones. I'll wrap it up and leave you guys to the uh, golf. And thank you, thank you so much.